So today we were talking a lot about um, neural networks and things like that. Today I'm going to focus a bit more on, on something else, um, which is uh, well related to a feature metric and in the context of uh, conditional probabilities. This is joint work that I did in 2014 with Johannes Rao and Nihat Ai, and um, I'm going to motivate it a bit. <clears throat> well, I mean, the feature metric, uh, typically you, you, you know this definition. Um, we have seen it in several talks today, like especially uh, it appeared in the talk by Luigi in the context of the um, natural gradient, uh, in Nihat Ai's talk, uh, Frederick Barbaresco also mentioned it in context of the kramer rao bound and uh, Mr. Guta as well. Uh, these are some other names that have come up during the conference, especially Volchenzos. Uh, work from 45, uh, from 72, I mean. Um, Rao's work from 45, well, Amaris, Campbell, Lebanon. I'm going to talk about this a bit uh, today. And uh, well, Kaka de Peters et al. And also these extensions of the, um, uh, of the Chenzo characterization for, um, uh, for more general uh, settings, continuous settings. Uh, so why do we care about this? I mean, uh, the Fisher metric is uh, what well, has been studied a lot in the context of probability simplices, and now we want to talk about conditional probabilities. And the application already came up in, in Nihatai's talk. Uh, we have this sensory, sensory motor loop. We want to maximize a reward uh, as a function of um, a policy. A policy is a conditional probability distribution. Well, in some, um, well, in many cases, you want to parameterize this like that. So this is going to come up also in Johannes Rao's talk later. And this is one of the examples. We have this neural network, and this is producing conditional probability distributions, and we want to optimize the behavior. Um, now, what has been observed, uh, uh, well, the natural gradient uh, works efficiently in learning. This is one picture from uh, Peters et al.'s uh, paper. Uh, where they are showing just that this gradient flow is really different uh, in, for the Euclidean gradient and for the uh, Fisher gradient, and, uh, and that this can, uh, you know, lead for to, to faster learning. Okay, so this talk, uh, I am interested in the study of approaches to choosing a natural Riemannian metric for conditional probability distributions, and in particular, I want to consider um, three approaches. One is the classical one, as a Chenso type um, invariance characterization. Uh, the next one is a pullback through a natural embedding of conditional probabilities in a probability simplex. And the third one is um, sort of um, um, a, a more direct one where you say, um, you know, conditional probabilities just consists of several probability distributions, so why not use some kind of product structure um, on those? Okay, so this is, uh, this is the program again. Um, actually, each of these items corresponds to, to one approach. When did I start? Okay. Uh, okay, so as for the introduction, um, I already mentioned this. So Chensov, um, he came up with a characterization of the Fisher metric by postulating invariance under certain natural maps uh, called Markov morphisms. And he basically proved that this is the only metric that is invariant under these transformations. Campbell, he extended this characterization to the cone of positive measures, or you know, when you disregard normalization, basically. Lebanon then, again, he uh, incorporated some of the structure of conditional probabilities, uh, meaning you have a matrix structure uh, and uh, you can, you can um, you can incorporate some of this structure into the, the mappings, the morphisms that, that you study. And, and then, well, Kakade and Peters et al., they are more from the, the context of reinforcement learning, and they were looking at um, a more pragmatic, maybe, way of, of doing this, and uh, which, at, at the end of the day, corresponds to embeddings of conditional probabilities in the probability simplex. Um, yeah, but I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but uh, so let me just fix the notation. Um, I'm going to be looking at finite sets uh, of events, uh, 1 through n, and the probability simplex then. Um, well, it's you know, just defined like this, n minus 1 dimensional. And the conditional probability polytope, this is, if you wish, 
This is a, a Cartesian product of probability simplices. So these are stochastic matrices. Each row is a probability distribution and all the rows are independent of each other. So this is really just a Cartesian product. Okay, um, the tangent space, uh, maybe a very transparent way of, of thinking about these tangent spaces is just saying, okay, these are, it's a subset of the tangent space of Rn. This is the linear space spanned by the uh, derivatives with respect to the you know, uh, coordinate vectors. And uh, it is a subset that uh, satisfies this property, namely that um, the weights of, um, uh, of each of the components add to zero. So you stay really, uh, you know, um, in the, you don't change the norm um, of the, the one norm basically of, of, of the vectors when you move along these tangent vectors. And the Fisher metric, if you, if, you, if you describe it in terms of these coordinates, you, well, you, you, will, you will express it like this. It's just uh, you know, a sum of, um, of the product of, of the two tangent vectors that you're multiplying divided by the value of the probability distribution at that point where you are evaluating the, the metric. <clears throat> Okay, so now we, I, as I said, I wanted to, to talk about uh, this invariance characterization. So just to remind you uh, briefly about what this means. Um, if we have two Riemannian manifolds, this is a manifold E with a metric G and another one with primes. Um, and we have an embedding between the two. So a mapping that goes from E to E prime. Now we want to know or, or say what is, an, what is, to, what is an isometry? When, when is F an isometry? The way we do that is we first look at the push forward through F. This is a mapping of tangent vectors in E to tangent vectors in E prime. That works just basically by the chain rule of derivatives. So this is you know, an arbitrary tangent vector here and then you just compute, um, you just add the, the, the derivative of, of, the, of the mapping. Um, okay, so once you know how to map uh, tangent vectors from one Manifold to the other one, uh, you can define this pullback. So you take the metric from the image manifold and uh, you are going to do something to be able to use it in the first manifold. So, and that something is this pullback. So you basically evaluate the push forward of two arbitrary vectors uh, at the point you know, that you obtain by this function and uh, and you declare that to be uh, you know, the value of, of the product in the original manifold. And then, uh, so this embedding F is called an isometry. If whatever you get from this construction is the same as you would have uh, originally. So you, you recover the, the metric in the, in the original manifold. So in this case, we say F is an isometry between these two manifolds, or we say um, that G, this metric, is invariant under F, under this embedding. Is this fine? Yes. Excellent. Um, okay, so what is the result of Chen Uh He wants to uh, look at um, isometries and uh, he wants to say there are certain natural maps that better be, um, so better be isometries if, if the metrics are the, the appropriate ones. So first we have to talk about what are natural maps. And uh, so Natural maps in, in, in that discussion are these Markov mappings or Markov morphisms. Uh, they are very simple. These are linear maps. So you take a probability vector and you multiply it by a matrix. Just that this matrix has a block structure. Nihat Ayek talked about this at the beginning of his talk. Um, so, and, uh, yeah, so th this have basically this form. So this is the, the, the probability distribution and the matrix has row blocks. They are all disjoint and the, the, the rows add up to one. And this embeds, you know, probability simplex like that. So basically it splits certain events, assigning the probability, uh, well, to some other, to, to a larger number of events potentially. Um, but what is nice about this, I mean, these are maps that are just linear maps defined on, on RM, um, but they define embeddings of probability simplices. And this is because they preserved the one norm of the input. So even though, you know, you can define them here, but they define embeddings of probability simplices. So, okay, here is Chen's of theorem. Um, essentially, he says, okay, let's say there is a, there is a metric, GM, uh, on the probability simplex delta m. This circle is just the interior, okay? So because you know, I don't want to have technicalities with the boundary, but uh, so there is a metric for each simplex um, for two, three, four, and so on. 
And, um, and we consider the case where every embedding by a Markov morphism, as defined in the previous slide, is an isometry. That's all we know. Then, necessarily, it is the case that this metric looks like that. So this is the Fisher metric that I had in the definition at the beginning. And conversely, if you have some C, this is a constant, um, then this expression defines a Riemannian metric uh, for which every embedding by a Markov map is an isometry. In, in other words, you can basically choose any arbitrary constant C um, here. So this is the characterization. Uh, this, is, this is nice, so this is actually, um, yeah, most of the time when people say the Fisher metric is a natural metric, this is, this is actually the argument that is used most of the time for, for making that claim. Uh, okay, so now what did Campbell do? Campbell uh, provided a generalization of this or an extension to a positive cone, uh, basically saying, okay, let's say we're not considering mappings between probability simplices, but just mappings between positive measures. What happens then? So, and he said, uh, okay, same setting, consider here a sequence of Riemannian metrics on Rm this time, plus, so positive cone, and then um, assume that every embedding by a Markov map is an isometry. Then, the characterization looks a bit different. Uh, well, in the sense that uh, we obtain here um, this part is again the part that is divided by the probability value uh, at, you know, at the coordinate corresponding to the product. We have here this delta. Again, so this is the same that we had before. This is this constant, basically. But there is an additional term here um, that depends on the, you know, on the, on the one norm of the, of the vector that where you are standing. Um, okay, so but conversely, if you have these constants given, or functions rather, um, which satisfy these conditions, then uh, these are Riemannian metrics for which every embedding by these Markov maps is an isometry. Um, so this is, a, this is an, an, an extension um, for, for, the positive, for the positive measures. Uh, what is different here? Um, Okay, on the one hand, you can say um, if you restrict your attention to the probability simplex, then the choice of this constant A is immaterial. So why is that? Because we define this, I mean, we were looking at these tangent vectors for the probability simplex, and we said um, you can describe them as, the, as those sums of elementary derivatives which uh, add up to zero. So the weights actually add up to zero. So if you add up this over you know, a tangent vector of the probability simplex, this is a constant, so that will add to zero. So the choice of A is immaterial <coughs> on the simplex, and these Campbell metrics restrict to the Fisher metric as characterized in Chenzov's theorem. However, Chenzov's theorem is not a direct implication of Campbell's theorem. What is the reason for this? Is because you're requiring isometry Isometry is in the positive cone, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have, you know, if you depart from isometries in the probability simplex, it doesn't, um, you have to show that there is a correspondence between isometries in the probability simplex and isometries in the positive cone. But this is not difficult to do. So one can actually obtain Chenzo's theorem from Campbell's theorem. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so the third point here is the Campbell's metrics. They, um, they define metrics on positive matrices. I mean, we're talking about uh, stochastic uh, matrices, or conditional probabilities, that's what we are interested in. So we could actually come and use Campbell's uh, theorem uh, to obtain a metric for positive matrices, in particular for stochastic matrices. But the problem with that is that these general Markov maps that are used to characterize these metrics they do not really have a natural interpretation in terms of matrices. You agree or you disagree? No, I agree with the theorem, but this incompatibility between the two formulations means something that there is uh, another more general result, no? It's, it's, uh, it's very uncomfortable, eventually. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, that's why we need a, you know, a characterization that uh, respects the structure of the matrices. Okay. Okay, I'm getting there. <laughs> so your criticism is the motivation of the main work that he's going to present. 
Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I. I mean. Okay. So okay. So that that's exactly. I mean, the same criticism that Lebanon had. So Lebanon said, okay, this Campbell result is really nice. It works for positive measures, but we have more structure. We have the structure of this conditional distribution. So we we better define mappings that are natural and respect the, um, in terms of that structure. So he considered this uh, other definition of, of morphisms and that, that I am calling here Lebanon maps. Um, and they are defined like this. Again, we have a linear map, but uh, this looks a bit more complicated than before. Uh, what is happening here is uh, the input is M, it's a matrix in this case. And we're going to build this row product. The row product is, is defined like this. Basically, you take each row of, of this matrix and you apply a Markov morphism to it. It's, it's a linear map. But you do that for each row independently. And then, uh, additionally, you have this linear transformation from the left. So when you are done with this multiplication, you apply this transformation from the left. Um, so why these maps are natural for conditional probabilities is something that I'm going to discuss later, or for matrices in general. Um, so, th so this is fine for matrices. Let, let's just take that for now. Uh, this is again an illustration of the definition, just to make it really clear. Um, so this is the matrix. Each row is mapped by one of these partition matrices. And uh, once we're done with that, we have basically mapped um, uh, embedded each row into a larger probability simplex. And then this matrix, what it does is it, it copies each of the rows of the resulting matrix and scales it by the value of the matrix. And that's it. So this is the result from 2004. Again, we have now a sequence of this matrix, uh, um, Riemannian matrix, GKM, K is for, you know, the side length and the, the, the other side length. Uh, so it's a double sequence. And um, uh, this is positive, the positive cone. And if every Lebanon map is an isometry of these guys, then we obtain this characterization of the metric. Uh, actually, it's very similar to what we had before. But now we have three terms instead of only two terms or one term. Um, this first part here uh, basically corresponds to what we had from Chensov's theorem. So it's just dividing by the probability, essentially, uh, of the one entry that we're multiplying. And we have this scaling factor. But now there is another term. And each of these terms basically corresponds to one row of the matrix. So this uh, um, absolute value MA is the, is the one norm of the row. And then we have finally a constant, a constant term, or a, a function that only depends on the one norm of all the entries. Okay, and this characterization is in some sense um, sharp because okay, you can basically invert the statement. If you, you have defined these guys, then uh, you know all these embeddings are, are isometries. Okay, that's um, that's good um, in in some sense. Um, okay, so. Okay, this is, um, this is just a, a remark about uh, when, for which choices of these constants is the metric indeed positive definite. So this is so, something. Um, now, uh, similar to what we had with Campbell, if we restrict attention to the conditional probabilities, uh, then the choice of these constants A and B is immaterial. Because here, uh, the, the sum of the coordinates of the tangent vectors in each row are zero, so this thing vanishes. And uh, this one will be the same, so it will also vanish. So we will, we will get a metric of this form on the, on the polytope of conditional probabilities. Um, this, is, uh, yeah, this, is, this is good. Um, uh, th this is good. Now we have here, actually, we have two, two Kronecker deltas. And, and indeed, this is the case because we need to first, uh, so when we're multiplying these vectors, we have to ensure basically the, 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 the same rows and then the same uh, columns. Um, anyways. But, uh, well, another part of this remark is that the Lebanon class of metrics is larger than Campbell's. So we have this additional constant, right? So, and the reason is that these Lebanon morphisms, these are, this is a smaller class of transformations than 
the, the Markov morphisms that we're considering Campbell's results. So basically, we are requiring variance with, with respect to a smaller class of mappings. Therefore, the, the, um, we get more flexibility in the characterization. So, but wait. the thing is, when you take like a, a vector of like positive like weights, and you do like any, um, well, I will put things in another, another, another sense. Like if you if you take a, a, a matrix, so that's supposed to be like a, a, a matrix with a particular constraint, for example, this, the rows sum to one or something like that. Yes. So the stochastic has a stochastic interpretation. So in general, if you put that matrix, if you embed that matrix and as a vector and you apply any Markov transformation to the vector and then you read that again as a transition matrix, for example, you won't have the good structure. Now, for example, nothing says that the rows will sum to one again. You are absolutely right. And so the Levan the, the map solves that problem. I mean, if I embed like a, a stochastic transition matrix, I obtain a stochastic transition matrix. Exactly, that's the problem with Levan's results. You don't. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I am still in the introduction. I mean, Levanon, he he recognized that. You know, if you are looking at these general Markov morphisms. That's great if you're talking about probability distributions, but you don't have the structure of a matrix. Uh, so that, that was with, with Chenzo and with Campbell, and Lebanon said, we, we need to incorporate the structure of a matrix. So he considered a smaller class of transformations, but now the problem with these transformations is that they don't map the stochastic transition matrices to stochastic transition matrices. So they, they break the, they dissolve the normalization of the rows. So therefore, somehow you can say this characterization is nice for matrices, but not necessarily for stochastic matrices. <clears throat> and unless, well, here, unless you really don't change the number of rows. But uh, yeah, in that case, you know, that's, that's basically. Anyways, but nonetheless, uh, these results are, are really interesting. Um, if you would try to interpret them in terms of, of bivariate probability distributions. So you have still matrices, but you don't have the row normalization. In that case, if you look at that restriction, so this is basically a probability simplex for two random variables, uh, then the characterization looks like this. It still is not super nice, but if you require the invariance not only under the Lebanon maps, but under their duals, which basically means that you transpose the matrix, you don't give any special role to, uh, role to any of the variables, then uh, this thing vanishes and you are left with this thing alone, which is really, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a product feature metric or it's a, it's a feature metric at the end of the day. So w without this part. So, I mean, you could claim, or maybe an observation is that this, this analysis is good for uh, joint probability distributions of two variables, but not necessarily for stochastic transitions. Okay, <clears throat> so that, that was nice, um, but that's also a reason why we wanted to have a characterization that is actually natural with respect to morphisms between stochastic uh, matrices. Um, so, uh, we basically already said this, Lebanon characterizes the metrics, but uh, they dissolve the row normalization. So we want to consider other maps that define natural embeddings of conditional probability distributions. <clears throat> and well, here is a bit of the interpretation, both of the Lebanon maps and uh, the maps that we were looking at and why we looked at them. Um, so one idea is to think of stochastic matrices are, as channels, you can compose channels. Uh, so if you have a channel K and you want to, so this is mapping a random variable X to a random variable Y, and you want to compose this to map to a yet another random variable set, you just build a matrix multiplication of these stochastic matrices. What is interesting though is that um, this is the same structure that you have if you are building the joint probability distributions. So if, if, if this is a stochastic matrix, this will allow you to compute a joint probability distribution for the input x and the output y. Uh, in this particular case, you will get, you know, uh, well, a stochastic mapping or, or, or uh, 
Yeah, so, but more generally, uh, and this is part of how this raw product ar arises, you can, you can imagine that the second channel not only depends on the, on the value that, um, that came out from the first channel, but it also depends on the input to the first channel. And if you do that, you, you end up building these row products where each row of the, of the stochastic matrix K is multiplied by an independent, uh, well, in this case, a uh, Markov, Markov morphism. Okay, that's one part. The other thing that you can do is you can consider transformations of the first variable, not only of the, of the output variable of this channel, but on, of the input variable. And if you do that, what is interesting is that, uh, well, you get this multiplication from the left, as in Lebanon's uh, characterization for probability distributions, but for the channels, if you really wanted to do the same, you had to replace this matrix R by something else, um, which is, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a block partition matrix, but it is not normalized. Rather, uh, all the entries are either zero or one. So it will look like this. Instead of having row normalization adding to one, each entry is one. <clears throat> okay, so what is nice about this, okay, maybe first this summary of this to sum up. Uh, if we combine transformations due to this um, mm, uh, channel that depends on the input, um, how to put it, uh, here is a, a random variable, I have a channel that I'm looking at, K, that maps X to Y, now I want to look at another channel Q that depends on both the input value and the output value and produces a new value, then that would be given by this, um, by this row product. And now I want to look at the transformation of the input variable, and this would be described by R. If I'm looking at joint probability distributions, I would have a product with, uh, with a stochastic matrix. If I'm looking at the channels, I would have a product with this row partition indicator matrix, like this. <clears throat> Anyways, what is nice about this is that this actually is mapping conditional probabilities to conditional probabilities. So it preserves the one norm of the matrix rows. So we can define our conditional embeddings uh, in this form. So I mean, they are again linear maps are very similar to the Lebanon maps, but they now map conditional distributions to conditional distributions. We also want to consider a special case, which is when um, the blocks of R are homogeneous. That means all blocks have the same size. And this would correspond to the case where this mapping will have something to do with yet another va random variable involved. Um, that will become clear in a moment why we do that. Okay, so uh, once we have this uh, description of, of mappings, um, uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can go on uh, and try to produce a characterization, and this is what we obtain, uh, similar to, to, to Lebanon's derivation. Um, so, but we get here, after doing the analysis, we get this factor K. K is the number of rows, essentially. So, I mean, we get uh, here similarly the value of the, of the matrix entry, uh, the total entry sum, um, and we get here these K squares. Uh, these, are, these are the number of rows. So, in a certain sense, these matrices, these, these metrics are scaled depending on the number of, of, of entries of, 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 um, of the space we're looking at. Um, conversely, if we have a, a sequence of such metrics, then they uh, produce, uh, for these metrics, every of these um, homogeneous conditional embeddings is, a, is an isometry. Exactly. So, but yeah. What happens if you normalize the R? If you normalize the R, you get Lebanon's maps, but they are not mapping conditional matrices to conditional matrices. Okay, that's the thing, yeah. <laughs> so, so, that's the only, the only difference between your maps and the Lebanon maps? Is this, uh, this is not everything. Um, as you can see, I am looking here at homogeneous mappings where the blocks of R are all the same size. What is interesting is that, okay, I am here still talking about the real case, right? If I restrict this to the case of um, conditional probability distributions, then A becomes immaterial and B becomes immaterial. So I'm left only with this term, so which is nice. 
this is actually what we want. So this is the, the Fisher metric basically and k is just a constant. It's just the number of, of, of rows. So this, I mean for you this is not a, a reason to worry. But uh, I mean when I move on with the other characterizations this, this will become maybe a bit more interesting. Anyhow, but here I am using homogeneous, homogeneous embeddings, so the, which is a condition that was not present in the characterization of Lebanon's. But what is interesting though is that uh, homogeneity is needed. So we also, we also show that there is no family of metrics, either here or in the conditional probabilities polytopes, for which every embedding is an isometry. So if you don't have this homogeneity of the blocks of R, then, then you cannot produce this type of characterization. Oh, and here again is just uh, you know what happens if you restrict attention to the to the stochastic matrices. So then the uh, you know this guy looks like this. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh yeah, okay, so, so that's basically the message here was we obtained basically a specialization of Lebanon's metric. So, so this is all very consistent and nice with the difference that we now have here indeed mappings which appear to be natural mappings between conditional probabilities. Okay, let me move on to the second kind of approach to, to defining uh, Riemannian metrics on, on polytopes and more generally point configurations and exponential families, that was the idea here. And this is just to, uh, well, in the previous section I was discussing, um, we, you postulate invariance with respect to natural morphisms and then you obtain this characterization. Now another viewpoint is to say, let's just take whatever space we, we want to define a metric on, embed it in the simplex and pull back the, 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 the geometric structures from there. So. Um, and you can certainly do that very nicely for polytopes because, well, if you, if you know exponential families, they have these two ways of, of describing them. Well, especially if you have this uh, finite, finite number of events, uh, you can parameterize them in terms of, of, of polytopes. And that means basically that um, you can identify this polytope with an exponential family in the simplex and pull back the geometry from the simplex. Uh, how does this work? Um, uh, well, first the exponential family, you define it by first writing a matrix, it's a sufficient statistics matrix, and then you, um, uh, well, th this matrix is, uh, uh, well, you can call, no, I mean, it's a sufficient statistics matrix, that's it. So, and then, uh, this here is, uh, in this particular case, is just a reference measure. This is the normalization and, and so on. Now, uh, well, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, another thing that you may know about exponential families is that if you, you evaluate the Fisher metric, then you are going to obtain the covariance of the sufficient statistics matrix. So it's going to look just like this. Uh, so th these are probability distributions, they live in the simplex and, and you can use the definition that I showed you at the very beginning for the Fisher metrics and uh, it's going to look like this. Now um, the convex support of the exponential family is uh, you just take the columns of the sufficient statistics matrix and you build the convex hole. And this is the same as building the expectation values of the, of the sufficient statistics. Um, so these are then what people call the expectation parameters because they are equivalent to building the expectation values only with respect to the distributions in the exponential family. So there is indeed a homeomorphism between the exponential family and its convex support or the closure or you know the closure of the exponential family and the convex support or the relative interior of the convex support and the exponential family. And what this means is that uh, you can map basically the points in the convex support to points in the exponential family which are in the simplex and this mapping is the inverse moment map. Uh, you can think of it like this. There is the probability simplex on the one hand and here is this uh, independence model of two binary variables and the convex support polytope in this case is a square. So basically this square you can map it into the simplex and you can do the same for any polytope really. Sorry, can you repeat the Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, this is just a very generic, general definition of an exponential family. 
E stands for exponential family, it's a manifold. Um, and the way it works is you take some matrix and you build um, um, linear combinations of the rows of that matrix. So basically you look at, a, what does that mean is that you are looking at a, a linear space of a linear or affine space and, uh, and, and, and you put it here and you exponentiate that. So you're from physics, right? So, no, no, no. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, exponential family. I, my personal way of thinking about it is I take a linear space and I exponentiate it. Okay. Uh, so it becomes some kind of curvy and I just yeah, norm normalize it. So the normalization is, you know, just that all the entries add to one. Um, yeah, right. So this is all linear combinations of the rows of the matrix A, basically. This is just some reference measure, and this is the normalization. Um, yeah, so, I mean... Okay, anyways. Right, the linear space, exponentiate, normalize, you get something inside of this probability simplex, that's nice. If you build, if you however build the convex hull of the columns of this matrix, you get a polytope, which is also equivalent to this exponential family, or is a parametrization basically. So these two things are, um, are in one-to-one -one relationship. Now, we were interested in polytopes, right? And we know that there is a natural way of defining a Riemannian metric in the simplex. So we can, given that we have this identification, we can pull back the geometry from the simplex to this polytope. I, I gave you the definition of a pullback metric. So, and this is it just saying that again, I mean, I have some polytope and I use this polytope, the vertices of the polytope, I take them as the columns of some matrix which I then declare the sufficient statistics matrix of an exponential family. And then I have the embedding of the polytope as an exponential family in the simplex. And with this embedding, I can pull back the Fisher metric from the simplex to the polytope. And I can define this as, as the Fisher metric of the polytope or the pullback uh, through the inverse moment map. Now, is this a natural construction? Well, exponential families are certainly natural, but still, I mean, why it should be, be natural? Um, then also you can ask, um, is there also a way of talking about um, invariances and isometries uh, between polytopes, uh, or even to obtain some kind of chance of characterization for these metrics? And uh, yes, that's, that's the case. So we want to define here some kind of morphisms between polytopes or between exponential families. Um, and one way of doing that, one natural way maybe is to say, okay, we're going to have a mapping that takes some polytope and puts it inside of some other polytope. And in the context of exponential families, if you're thinking about um, polytopes as being the convex support of an exponential family, one natural thing to, to consider is, 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 is when this mapping takes the vertices of one polytope to the vertices of the other polytope and defines a, a bijective relationship. So, in many cases, these exponential families, each vertex is going to correspond to an elementary event. So, you want to preserve the number of elementary events, you, you, have, to, you have to require this condition, that there is a bijective, a bijection between the vertex sets. Okay, if you, if, if, if you think that this is fine and you define it like that, then this will imply this following thing for the exponential families, that one of the exponential families is going to be containing the other, that they're going to live in the same probability simplex, and um, that these moment maps, they sort of, you can pull them through this, em through this embedding. So, so the moment map of one exponential family is going to factor through the embedding um, into the other, of the other one. Okay, now another thing that is interesting to look at is the inverse of this function, um, of this embedding, and that you could define it like this. Uh, on the one hand, you take an inverse moment map and then you use the other moment map. Uh, I'm going to show you a few pictures. So this is an example. So this would be a P prime. It's a polygon, it's a polytope. In this case, just an octagon, it's two-dimensional. And this is P, 
P in this case is a three-dimensional cube. So what were the conditions that I was talking about? I was talking about there is a bijection between the vertices of this polytope and the vertices of this polytope. Um, yeah, there is a bijection between these vertices and these vertices. Then I was saying that this family is embedded here, it's a subset. Uh, ah, well, I, I, I'm not drawing this family really, but I'm going to be drawing uh, I'm going to be drawing this thing, so the embedding of of P, of the embedding of um, yeah, I don't even know what I'm drawing, but um, <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> so, anyways, you, you can think of this as the same way that I was embedding an exponential family in a probability sim, a, a convex support polytope in a probability simplex. You can think of this as embedding a uh, a polytope into another polytope, as some kind of exponential family within another polytope. So this is another example. Actually, these figures also came up in Nihat's talk, but in a different context. <laughs> um, okay, so but so this is the illustration. So we have here um, uh, a, a bigger polytope, an embedding of a smaller polytope in there. And we have here a containment of a small exponential family, a larger exponential family. We have that some of these things factor through each other so that this diagram commutes. And at the end, this means that this mapping is an isometry from this polytope into its image inside of this. So this gives, in some sense, um, you know, um, you a way of thinking about um, isometric embeddings of polytopes into each other and will end up leading to a characterization akin to, to, to chains of ones. But uh, so in the context of both exponential families and, um, and polytopes. Uh, on the other hand, the kind of exponential families that we were looking at here were relatively um, constrained for the reason that we were looking at sufficient statistics matrices where each column was a vertex of the convex support polytope. Now, there are other sufficient statistics matrices where this is not the case, and this can also be covered actually. And this is what we were looking at in, uh, under this name, weighted point configurations. Uh, and here we consider a matrix. We are not requiring anymore that uh, the vertices are, um, or that the columns are vertices of a polytope. And in addition to that, we, we consider here the reference measure explicitly. And we want to define here also morphisms between such pairs of matrix and, and reference measures. Um, and, and define morphisms between them and some invariance characterization. Before doing that, so I mean, once you have this kind of thing, you can also define a Fisher metric on the convex hull of this matrix, so it's, it's a polytope, and uh, define it as the pullback of the Fisher metric on the simplex that you obtain through the inverse of the moment map. So, as I was saying, so this defines an exponential family. So you can take this polytope, embed it as an exponential family, and pull back the Fisher metric from the, from the inverse moment map. Um, actually, I already mentioned these morphisms between these pairs. Um, they map, on the one hand, uh, the... Uh, they map, on the one hand, these columns to each other, and they map... Um, uh, well, th there is that relationship then between the points, and you need to you need to make sure that the, the reference measure behaves nicely, so that you know, the blocks add to each other. These are similar at the end of the day to these Markov morphisms, if you want. So in fact, they re they define these Markov mappings, so in this particular way. And uh, if you do this, you obtain a slight extension of what I was showing you before, and um, and. Uh, and actually, by Chensos theorem, you get here an embedding of, of one simplex into the other, which pulls through all the way until here. So you get an, an embedding of, of one polytope into the other, and you get also the, uh, the isometry. OK, so this is the theorem. This is just putting all, all of the things that I was saying together. Um, we are looking here at, at polytopes, these ones. Uh, we cannot relate to these, uh, these pairs of a matrix and a weighted point configuration, and these define morphisms. And uh, we assume that, um, that, uh, that, this, uh, that these are, uh, wait a second, what, I'm, what slide am I in? Uh, no, 
this one is it. So we have a Riemannian metric on these polytops and we assume that these morphisms are embeddings. Then, um, then we have that the pullback of the Fisher metric is, um, uh, this characterizes actually, if we require that these are isometric embeddings, all of these uh, morphisms, then we obtain a characterization of the, of the Fisher metric, of this pullback of the Fisher metric um, as, the, as the only one that, that satisfies this criterion. Um, which, which is nice. So it's, it's, so to speak, a different way of um, uh, of looking at this, uh, at how to define a metric on a polytope. Um, okay, a special case is the case when these uh, polytopes actually correspond to um, stochastic matrices. So in the case of stochastic matrices, you have these products of, of probability simplices. So these are very special types of, of polytopes are products of simplices and the exponential families that correspond to those are the independence models um, which look like this and for which the sufficient statistics is, you know, is, well, is a particular sufficient statistics matrix um, and anyways and in this particular case the, the, the pullback of the Fisher matrix looks like this which is um, well something that I want to discuss uh, well later on in more detail but uh, the point is that this is again a product Fisher metric, if you want. So for each row of the matrices, you have a, you have a Fisher matrix. Um, this is actually this example is an example of um, of that situation. This particular exponential family is an independence model, and this is a product of two simplices, namely a one-dimensional simplex that goes like this and another one-dimensional simplex that goes like that. So uh, squares and cubes in general are products of, of simplices. Uh, cubes are products of one-dimensional simplices. Um, so it's an example of that. Um, okay, so the Fisher metric on the product of simplices uh, is equal to the product of the Fisher metrics on the factors. So that's just what I was saying and uh, that means that for each row you have um, you know, one particular Fisher metric for, for that particular row. Um, then what else were we talking about? So this is, um, uh, yeah, we define this one. Um, yeah, this is, this is wrapping up basically. So we had uh, one way that was uh, using the polytop as, as such. Uh, we had another one which was using uh, all those embeddings that we were talking about. Uh, for those, we had this factor 1 over k. Here we have another, just a constant, an arbitrary constant. Um, I'm going to get to this in one moment. Anyway, so, but these are product Fisher matrices. That's, that's, that's maybe what's interesting. Uh, so now what we wanted to ask is, what happens if we say we want to define this product Fisher matrix um, for conditional models and just um, see under which conditions these are natural things or what makes them natural. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so we, we look at this weighted sum of Fisher metrics on the individual rows, which I was calling now product Fisher matrices. Uh, now these have appeared, I already mentioned that at the very beginning, uh, Amari, uh, so Luigi Malabo mentioned this in his talk, that he, he used this kind of definition in supervised learning. Kakae and Peters in reinforcement learning, and this has been used also in applications. Sahedi and I, they, they were looking at this for optimizing the predictive information. Okay, <clears throat> here uh, just to mention again what was the construction of Kakae's and, um, and, and Peters et al. So we have this sensory motor loop, um, there is a process running and going on and um, what Kakae did was, okay, let's look at this conditional matrix and just look at one row and define the Fisher, the Fisher matrix as, as always and he called this the point Fisher information matrix. And he said for the process as such, what we can do is just uh, take this sum or what I was calling a product of the, of the matrix uh, for each individual row, you get one, one component basically and you're weightening, he, he, he attached to each row a particular weight and this weight is the stationary distribution under this process. But there was no specific motivation for doing that, so he just called it the average Fisher information matrix. 
Uh, so in the characterization that I was presenting earlier, we had on the one case a weight 1 over k, the number of rows, and in the other case we had some uh, arbitrary constant. And here, uh, I mean, he said, okay, let us attach to these rows a weight corresponding to the uniform distribution that occurs in this process. Now, Peters and his collaborators, what they did was to say, um, well, actually, maybe we can, um, uh, well, they argue that this, there is a way of characterizing this actually as the Fisher matrix or obtaining these weights in a natural way which was to look at these so-called rollouts and look at the definition of the Fisher metric for the rollouts and they proved that this was actually the same as this one. So that this weight of the individual rows, they, they come up from this, from this process. <clears throat> one way or the other, you know, you, you can say, okay, why is this a natural thing to do or, or why not? So, so anyways, but we wanted to, to study this, this product Fisher metric. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here this is a rollout, so what I'm talking about, this is a conditional probability, right? Conditional distribution, but here we are looking only at, um, um, okay, maybe I should say, uh, so this is understood as a policy in this process, and here tau is actually a, a rollout, which is uh, a sequence of observations, or a sequence of states. So it's a joint probability distribution over a sequence of states. And n is the number of, of time steps that you're looking at. So it's basically the length of tau. Dividing by n is not very nice. The limit is n. Yeah, I mean the reason for this is that, okay, so here, this weight, d pi, this is a stationary distribution of some Markov process. But how, is, how are you going to obtain this naturally? I mean, a natural or a nice way in which this can happen is if this process is aperiodic and irreducible and you know, this is your limit distribution of the process. So it will naturally emerge. And uh, this is basically the limit that is having you uh, see the emergence of this limit distribution. Um, it is like uh, for the infinite of the experience. No, it's, it's an inverse of covariance. Okay, it's, it's, it's a good thing. No, it, it's, it's, it doesn't converge if you don't yes. divide by n. So it's similar to the Kolmogorov Sina entropy. Ah. The Kolmogorov, there you have the entropy rate for n block, but then you have to divide by n so that it converges. But it's not converging by zero because. No, 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 because no, no, no. Okay. this term involves like a lot of subsequent measurements, so that you have an effect that adds up at each step. Okay, so, so it's a trajectory. Yes, tau is a rollout. I mean, this is a chain of, of variables, if you want. It's a joint distribution of many time steps, of n time steps. Yes, well, we can talk later. I mean, okay, so maybe I'm gonna get to that in one second, but I mean, for us, this has been something really interesting to look at because we are not, I mean, we have not obtained this in our characterizations, but this is something interesting to look at, definitely. So, okay, so the idea is that we are looking at product Fisher matrix that have this general form. This is really just the same as this, if you want but uh, where these weights are, you know, are expressed as some row. And then, uh, uh, so, and each of these guys is a Fisher metric for the, for the particular row, for the eighth row. So, for example, this could be a stationary limit distribution of the sensor values, which is exactly what happens here, or, yeah. So, and the question that we have is, uh, what properties of the polytope embeddings uh, yield this product of polytope embeddings? What kinds of polytope embeddings will yield this product Fisher metric as the pullback of the Fisher information metric on the probability simplex? 
So that's something we were looking at. So uh, here for illustration, I discussed in the previous section actually an embedding using these exponential families. This is another way of embedding conditional probability distributions in the simplex, and it's simply by saying, okay, let's define a, a marginal distribution to the conditional distribution, so that we obtain a joint probability distribution. So here is like an embedding of, of this square for a particular choice of the marginal distribution, and here is for another choice of the marginal distribution. So this is the map that embeds this thing like that. If you look at these kinds of maps, uh, you can also come and pull back the, the feature metric and see what happens. And this is actually what the feature metric looks like, the pullback of the Fisher metric, and you obtain nicely, I mean, this weighted sum of Fisher metrics, which is good, where the weights correspond to whatever choice of a marginal you had here. So we get back here, this thing is what you get um, here as the weights. <clears throat> okay, so um, are there natural maps that leaves these metrics uh, invariant? Yes, I mean the same maps that we were discussing in the first part of the talk. Uh, you, can, you can study this and how they transform these, these, these objects and this turn out to commute nicely and so we get this kind of, of result that says that um, if you have this double sequence of remaining metrics uh, on the polytope of conditional probabilities, um, then uh, then they satisfy this relationship, meaning that they are, um, that these things are isometries uh, for any conditional embedding F, which looks like we had it earlier. And conversely, we have like that if you have this um, Riemannian matrix, then um, if these things are embeddings, then um, there is a constant such that you know this relationship holds. So this is basically like a ca characterization of these types of, uh, of product uh, metrics. Okay, um, my summary is uh, so we or I presented I discussed three types of approaches to characterize distinguished metrics on uh, spaces of conditional probability distributions and more generally polytopes. In all of these cases, the characterized Riemannian metric was a product of a Fisher metric. Um, however, with different um, scaling factors or, or weights for the different rows. Uh, when we postulate the isometry with respect to these natural embeddings of conditional distributions, we obtain this factor 1 over k. Uh, when we had these embeddings as exponential families, we just obtained this constant factor c. And we uh, consider our embeddings by fixing a marginal distribution, we obtain these weights rho, which correspond to the marginal that you use for, for building the embedding. Now, which metric to use in practice? This should depend on the problem at hand. So what we think is that um, maybe uh, the embedding that you use uh, could reflect the natural uh, symmetries of the problem that you're looking at. Maybe in these reinforcement learning problems, uh, considering uh, for the marginal distribution, the stationary distribution is something natural, but this, this remains to, to, to be seen. So yeah, that's that, so thanks. So questions? Oh no, that's uh, uh, that's not Jonas Petas. That's Jan Petas. But they used to work at the same institution in Tübingen. Yes, but Jonas Petas is now in Denmark. Yeah. Yeah. He also works, by the way, on this uh, causal inference, which was the topic of of Tobias talk. Yeah. No, yeah, Petas oh. is well known for his work in robotics, and he has uh, he has done a lot in the context of the natural policy gradient and things like that. Yeah. Further questions? Yes. It's not a question. It's just uh, an appreciation. Congratulations. Is, uh, excuse me. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Further questions? So then let's congratulate. <laughs> <laughs>